I've been wondering, how hard could it be to get a computer from 1984 working again? Let's find out. A few episodes back on the Electronics Inside, we tore down this wonderful 1984 IBM 5155 portable computer. Portable-ish. Unfortunately, as we were turning it back on, this happened. Power's hooked up, motherboard is in, graphics card or the CGA card is in, hooked up to the monitor. Fingers crossed, this should be catastrophic or fantastic. Well, I feel like that was very uneventful. It was maybe a good thing, but it doesn't sound like the monitor switched on, which means I think the power supply is probably not happy. So obviously the power supply is in need of a little bit of attention, but what other little niggles has this computer developed in nearly the last four decades? I think we'll start with the power supply, try and get that running again, and then see what else we're gonna have to do to get this machine fully working. There's no particular reason to get this working again, other than it would just be really cool to get this historic icon running again. And, uh, you know, never hurts to up my skill set and problem finding a little bit more, including my soldering skills. So with that said, I think we're definitely going to start with the power supply and almost definitely a recap. Power supply extracted. I think at this point, because it's going to be a couple of weeks, potentially, by the time I get all my replacement capacitors to go in the power supply, I don't want to have lost or forgotten where any screws go. So I think in the interim, I'm actually going to reassemble everything else just for safekeeping. There we go. We'll pop that out of the way and carry on with just the power supply. So this is about as far as we got before and visually it checks out and to be honest still largely does but there was definitely the smell of some unhappy capacitor in there. Uh, if I was gonna put money on it, I mean we've got an incoming filter cap here, we've got some big ones over here, nothing has obviously gone but I think it's time to replace the lot just in case. So let's get the boards out. This board, all combination of boards, is regulation. I think this is the flyback transformer. It actually has the leads which connect straight onto the C13 lead. And this is unfortunately riveted onto the aluminium framing, so this is gonna have to be drilled off. And at the end, I'll do my best to replace it with nuts and bolts without making any modifications to the PCB. Just because if it needs repairing in the future, it'll be a lot easier to do. Okay, so if that's the incoming filter cap, we're gonna call that cap one. Then I'm gonna go through, take these off, and they're gonna be cap two, cap three, so on. And then hopefully we'll build up a full bill of material to replace all the caps on the board. Downside being that's a lot of caps. Eh, what are you gonna do? Just working my way through all the capacitors, and I finally found one it's looking a bit suspect. It's uh, slightly bulging on the bottom. 470 microfarad, 25 volt. And you see it's just starting to leak a tiny bit onto the board down here. So maybe we found our candidate. Like I said, I'm not worried. We'll replace the whole lot anyway, but it's looking promising. Okay, so I've taken off a nice big array of caps right now and three or four of them are looking very suspect. But just to be safe, I'm gonna replace the whole lot and uh, hopefully that'll make something work. Well, I've got a load of new capacitors. I've got a new IEC 13 connector to replace the one that may have slightly overheated. I've got some PCBs, I've got solder, flux, and a soldering iron. I guess that means there's only one thing to do. You can see on here I've written really clearly C24, and I've got the capacity of 2200 microfarad at 25 volts, and similarly, I've got this one, same spec, but was labeled up C9. So I purchased the closest ones I could get, which are 2200 microfarad at 35 volts. Put them open the package, and here is the new replacements. Similar body size, similar pin spacing, same or better specification. Fortunately, the board pretty much 
always marks the positive for the capacitors. You see just down there there's a positive marking. So I know the negative's got to go the other way. So insert the pins, push it right the way down. Okay, so the last last two caps that actually have to go on the board are actually these 200 volt, 470 microfarad. And look at the leads on the bottom of there. And these ones, it was obviously paramount that the lead spacing was right. I had to sort of forego the physical structure so long as they didn't get wider. And these are a pretty good match, I would say. They seem to fit in the board over all right. As long as I get the polarity right and get them soldered in, we should be somewhere near getting the daughter boards on the side and the mains lead soldered back up and everything reassembled. All capacitors replaced. That's the mains incoming filter cap, so we don't have to worry about that just yet. But otherwise, let's snip the leads, get these all back together, then get the sides back on, which were these dirty little pins down here. Unfortunately, as the uh, input plug that I messed up is riveted on as opposed to bolted on, I'm going to have to take a grinder to it and just very carefully take the heads off these rivets and uh, replace it with bolts, which I have got. And at least a serviceable in the future if the worst should happen. Okay, I've got all the power leads connected back up and yes, I've had to use the recorded footage of taking it apart to remember exactly where each connection goes. So I'm going to solder these all up, make sure there's a big blob of solder on and then add the filter capacitor which I went across the live and uh, neutral, or the phase and neutral. And that capacitor will be replacing this original filter cap, which was enormous. Still same specification, but there you go. Yeah, that way around. Excellent. And P2 must be this one down here. They did not want to make this easy. Okay, earthing on the back, earthing on the front, get the fan installed, and I think we're ready for a test fire. Right, everything's back together. Got multimeter attached to a Molex connector, and a yellow, and the ground. This is all turned on, and you will notice I'm strategically turning this on from the wall end. Just in case it goes pop, it means I'm nowhere near it. So I guess this is the smoke test. Hopefully the fan will spin up and I'll get some readings on the multimeter. <sighs> well, I'm kind of getting 5 volts, or was getting 5 volts. Something else in there is not happy. What are the chances we've just blown the fuse and it's nothing too serious? Seems unlikely. I'm guessing the fan runs on 12 volts, so I'm just going to turn that back on just for a second. Oh, I'm still getting 5 volt even though I've switched rails on the Molex connector. It has an AT power supply. It doesn't need to be plugged into the motherboard, does it? Because I know on ATX there's a ground and a green lead that you have to jump at before it'll actually power on, but kind of assumed ATX was a little bit more, uh, or oh, AT, whatever this counts as, would just be on or off. I didn't think there'd be much more to it. Hmm, maybe I should plug it back in and give that a try, give it some load and actually the uh, motherboard connectors all plugged in. Putting this all back together, but something tells me this won't be the last time I have to take this power supply apart. Okay, I've now got this kind of Frankenstein half-assembled setup going. I've connected the two, I keep calling them AT power connectors. Don't know if this classifies as AT, but it's definitely pre-ATX down here. Still gonna be switching this from the wall and I've also got the CRT connected on its 12 volt connector. So hopefully that will power on and show us some kind of life. I'm gonna stand back and do this. So there's that big click when it turns on but I can't work out for the life of me where that's coming from. Has got the sound of a CRT trying its darndest. To help me out with fault finding this board, I found a PDF online titled The IBM 5155 Computer Power Supply by Dr. H. Holden from April 2018 and he has documented wonderfully how this board is supposed to work and all the component parts to it, as well as giving measurements and waveforms that you should find at various parts through the circuitry. Now, based on the description here, this board up here 
uh, the incoming power filter. So from there to these plugs at the bottom, you should get 230 volts. Um, that's basically the main incoming AC and smoothed AC. Uh, you've got this board underneath, which is actually separate to the incoming filters, which is the inrush limiting board. Now, I have a sneaky suspicion, because of the way this behaves when you turn it on, that that might be the problem, uh, because it sort of turns on for a second and clicks, and sometimes you see the fan try and turn, which makes me think it's just got too much inrush current, which could be an overloaded output, it could be a failed component somewhere else on the board. So let's poke around and see what we can find. So there's a relay down here on the inrush in protection board, which is the only relay on this, I think and you can hear just after this turns on a quick click which makes me think the overload protection is kicking in and stopping the power supply. And if you look at what the multimeter does which I've got connected to a 12 volt bus it actually shoots up very briefly after power on presumably before that relay triggers. Okay apparently there should be 23.9 volts on the outgoing side of CR2, which is a diode on the inrush protection board. So let me put the probe in place. My finger's nice and clear. Turn that on and see what we get. 148 volts. Seems a little on the high side. Okay, looking at this power supply, there is nothing obviously that has let the smoke out. I can't see any clearly failed components, any signs of arcing. Nothing bad that I can hone in on and just say, yes, that's clearly failed, let's replace it. I've not even got any arcing on the back of where we've replaced capacitors. Maybe I left a lead long and it's arc down to earth, but no, nothing that I can see anyway. So I guess this results in a very lengthy fault finding process, assuming I can find replacement components for all of the bits on here, which may be optimistic at this point. I don't know, this power supply may be beyond my skill level and um, hopefully not but I think it's one that's going to end up being a much longer longer term pro pro project than just one video but if there's anything that my career has taught me always have a backup plan so this is an AT power supply which runs in a reasonably standard form factor and you can see the motherboard has got the same pin out on P8 and 9 for our motherboard, it's got the same voltages on the same pins, which is great. This power supply has got three Molex connectors, so I can have two for the floppy drives and one to drive the monitor. It's got a built-in fan, so I don't have to worry about the external power for the fan on the back of that case. This is a 200 watt power supply, whereas this provides 165 watts to the PC, so this should cover it. Obviously, we're going to have some issues with cable lengths because these are enormous and these are not, but to get the PC up and running, it It'll do for now until I can get this all fixed. I think the biggest challenge of getting the AT power supply connected up to this is actually going to be the monitor interface. Like I say, we've got a Molex for the floppy drives, we've got the main motherboard connector, that's fine. It's just that that's a slightly different size and style. I and mean, I could just take the pins out and run that off a bench power supply. That might be the safest way to go. Just for the time being, I'm going to power the CRT up separately to this power supply just to make sure it all works to start with before we uh, make any permanent changes, or maybe I should phrase that as more aggressive changes. Okay, bench power supply hooked up to the CRT. Well, it's got the sound of a CRT, and that's pulling just about an amp, which sounds all right. 12 watts for a CRT, that's impressive, actually. That's... Everything's hooked up. Power supply for the CRT. Floppy drives of motherboard run off the AT power supply. <sighs> Fingers crossed. CRT on. AT, AT power supply. No! Something doesn't smell right, literally, in this case. So again, that power supply runs when not connected. That is the same pinout, the same configuration as the original board. Oh, yep, yeah, looks like the video card didn't like that. But why? 
That's my biggest question. So I think very simply to answer how hard can it be to get an IBM 5155 working again, at least for me and my skill set, very hard. Please don't take this as job done and I'm going to give up here, but clearly this is not going to get working in the short term. This may be a very long term project for me. I'm keen to learn more about this machine in, in itself, so getting it working long term would be amazing. And, you know, a point of pride to get it working. So, sorry I've made it worse at this point, I think. Nobody's more annoyed than I am, but I'm going to keep going and maybe one day I'll get there. If I ever do, I will let you know at the Element 14 community. Don't forget to go over there and give me verbal abuse for breaking what could be could have been an easily repairable PC uh, at element14.com forward slash presents. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, hopefully with a working 5155.